Coming up on Market to Market. The EPA puts RFS levels on hold and revisiting the highs and lows of an area all too familiar with oil cycles. Those stories and market analysis with Sue Martin next. Wherever your operation takes you or who you share it with, we'll be where we've been all along. With you from the word go. Proud sponsor of Market to Market. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company, offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it. This is the Friday, December 1 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. All President Trump wants for Christmas is to sign a tax bill. But heading into the weekend, budget hawks and an announcement from his former national security advisor could dash those hopes. The Dow Jones Industrial Average ventured past 24,000 Thursday before a major sell-off Friday morning after Michael Flynn pled guilty of lying to the FBI amidst the ongoing Russia investigation. But the market rebounded on word that Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell had the necessary votes to pass the GOP's tax bill. New home sales echoes wa echoed Washington's frenetic pace as transactions jumped 6.2 percent in October. Despite two devastating hurricanes, business investment drove the U.S. economy to compile the first back-to-back -back quarters of 3 percent GDP growth since 2014. And the crude oil rallied on news of the OPEC cartel and a group of allied oil producing nations agreed to extend output cuts through 2018. Similar policy has given fuel to a bull run in the market. Two other commodities looking for news to push them higher are corn and soybeans. One way to increase domestic demand for products is expanding the use of biofuels. The homegrown solution has bolstered bottom lines in the Corn Belt, where government policy on blending mandates is scrutinized. David Miller reports. The most recent battle over biofuel mandates came to an end this week. The Environmental Protection Agency agreed to a minimal increase of the renewable fuel standard that will put 19.29 billion gallons of biofuels in U.S. gas tanks next year. The figure is slightly higher than EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt's July recommendation, which had infuriated renewable energy lawmakers at the state and federal level. In response to Pruitt's move, Iowa Senators Charles Grassley and Joni Ernst, both Republicans, had threatened to delay confirmation of EPA appointees. After the pair received assurances from the White House there would be no cuts to the RFS, Texas Senator Ted Cruz, also a Republican, countered with a hold on Iowa Secretary of Agriculture Bill Northey's appointment to USDA. After this week's announcement of RFS levels, pro-ethanol industry and trade groups ranged from calling the move a modest step in the right direction to disappointment where it came to biodiesel mandates. Biodiesel producers, corn-based ethanol makers among them, had a negative reaction to what some called a meager 33 million gallon increase in their renewable volume obligations for 2018. Many also expressed concern that the basically flat volume increase might send the wrong signals and curtail industry expansion. For Market to Market, I'm David Miller. On Friday, the head of the Environmental Protection Agency visited a farm less than five miles from an Iowa ethanol plant. His appearance in the nation's top biofuel producing state drew mixed reactions. In the, in the sense that we met the deadline, November 30th, to actually get those volume obligations out across this country is something the agency hasn't done in a number of years. And I made a commitment during the process. <laughs> And for anyone in Washington, D.C. to look at you and not look at you as a partner, 
But as an adversary, to, to think that you're, you don't care about the water you drink and the air that you breathe is just simply wrong-headed. It made certainly the point that the numbers are out on time, and we all appreciate that. Uh, we you know, certainly wish that, especially the biodiesel numbers, were more aggressive than what they are. You know, I do want to give credit that they did stay with the 15 billion gallons, and they didn't buy into any of these crazy ideas to undermine the RFS. But also, to be fair, that was expected. The law says 15 billion gallons. President Trump had promised, I will protect the RFS. So while I want to say, hey, thank you for not going below that, it also isn't like they kind of had to move a mountain. I mean, that's kind of where we were. So we did not backpedal, and that's good. Oil Baron J. Paul Getty once said, oil is like a wild animal. Whoever captures it, has it. In recent years, new technology released previously unattainable black gold through hydraulic fracturing. And in 2011, Market to Market visited Williston, North Dakota, to learn how the Bakken has reshaped the region. Producer John Torpy returned to the Peace Garden State earlier this year for an update. In 2011, the nation was still recovering from the Great Recession, and unemployment teetered at 9%, except in North Dakota. At the time, there was a $1 billion surplus in state coffers, with unemployment at half the national average. Over the past decade, 50,000 jobs have been added to the workforce. Everything was booming in the Bakken, according to Lynn Helms, director of the North Dakota Department of Mineral Resources. You know, I really think we could get to a million barrels a day, uh, and eventually our population could reach a million in the state, and everybody gasped. That prediction was made in 2008, when the Bakken Shale Formation was producing oil and population growth was running at a record pace. Communities struggled to keep up with the rapid expansion. In Williston, North Dakota, the epicenter for shale oil production in the High Plains, the population more than doubled in a five-year period. Everything that we did in five short years, six short years, would take 20 or 25 years any, anywhere else. So we had to spend a lot of money. We had to do a lot of planning in a hurry. New roads, schools, and utilities were built to accommodate the growing, younger population. To help offset costs associated with the new improvements, Williston city leaders began negotiating a bigger take from a new tax revenue deal with state legislators and then Governor Jack Dahlgren. And then we went back and said, okay, let's flip this around. Let's go 60-40. 60% comes back to the West, 40% goes to Bismarck to be split among the rest of the state because that's, you know, this is where it's being generated at and this is where the impact is. And we're this close. We were this close to getting that passed. The governor had it in his budget. They start their session in January and oil tanks. After a meeting of OPEC member nations in early 2014, the price for a barrel of oil began to fall and plummeted for almost two years uneasy economic relations with non-member nations, and oversupply in the United States reduced the price from a high north of $100 to a low hovering around $40 per barrel. Along the Bakken Formation, also known as a play, rig counts of more than 200 in 2012 fell to just 27 in the spring of 2016. Obviously, what happened with OPEC in uh, 2014 and the, and the ramp up in production uh, really brought things to a halt in, in the shale plays. And then the Iranian uh, nuclear oil deal uh, was the, the second hit on that and took oil prices extremely low. And if OPEC were to ramp up production again, uh, we'd see prices and, and rig counts go back down. As the price of oil continued to fall, Williston residents kept a bullish outlook on the future of their town and the oil and gas industry in North Dakota. Drilling technology advancements, like enhanced oil recovery and the construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline, helped shale producers place themselves in a more favorable position for the return of better prices. During the last boom, you'd punch a hole in the ground and you may find oil, you may not find oil. This, this go around, you, put a, you go two miles down, two miles out, 
99.9% of the time you're going to have an oil well. So the oil is there, the technology is there. We've survived three years of a downturn, and I think that's, that's really pretty remarkable. And probably people in the Middle East didn't think that the American oil producer could survive uh, a downturn like this for a year, let alone three. We've proven that we can, we can get that production above a million barrels a day. By the fall of 2016, low oil prices were taking their toll. OPEC member nations voted to cut production by almost two million barrels a day for six months in an effort to push prices higher to a more profitable level of $60 per barrel. The plan worked. Prices, along with production, began to climb in the high plains. In September of 2017, according to the North Dakota Department of Mineral Resources, over 1.1 million barrels of oil were being pumped from the Bakken and Three Forks plays every day. The number of producing wells reached 14,190, a new all-time record for the region. That's the beauty of enhanced oil recovery is that you use the same well pad and many of the same well bores. You may have to add a few, but you don't increase your footprint. Uh, so the impact on the land and, and on the roads and that sort of thing is very minimal uh, for a big additional boost in oil recovery. All the opportunities rocking the Bakken, again, could be around for some time to come. Representatives of the 14 OPEC nations met in Vienna this week and voted to extend the current production cuts to the end of 2018. And after a decade of the Bakken, we've shown that we can grow small town North Dakota, billions of dollars of infrastructure being built across the rural part of North Dakota. That is going to allow us to really fine tune this oil play going forward. For Market to Market, I'm John Torpy. Next, the Market to Market Report. A lagging export market and weather fluctuations kept market swings in check. For the week, March wheat improved four cents, while the nearby corn contract also gained four cents. A reduction in biodiesel mandates from the EPA stifled the soy complex as the January soybean contract added a penny. January meal increased $4.30 per ton. March cotton expanded $1.35 per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, December Class Three milk futures soured 12 cents. The livestock complex was mixed as the February cattle contract declined 260 and nearby feeders weakened 297. The February lean hog contract moved higher by $1.33. The U.S. dollar index improved 13 points. The January crude oil rally ran out of steam, dropping 59 cents per barrel. COMEX gold melted 950 per ounce and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index shed a point to close at 429.30. Here now, to lend us her insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Sue Martin. Sue, welcome back. Thank you, Mike. We are glad to have you. And in case you want to go over things again, you can download or listen to our Market Analysis and Market Plus podcast anytime online at iptv.org slash mtom. Sue, so we've got to jump into this wheat market first. Get it out of the way. New contract low this week. What does that tell you as we head into the month of December? Well, we did have a new contract low, and I think we may have turned around and closed higher for the week, or very close to it. If we did not, corn did too. Um, I think that um, we're heading into the month here. You've got uh, concerns about very dry conditions starting to form in the southwest and through the plains. And then now talk of bitterly cold temps to impact us through December, especially the last half of December. So we'll see what happens because with this warmer than normal weather, wheat has emerged and so, you know, but yet it's a, like a cat with nine lives. It's hard to kill, but uh, it doesn't do it any good. So you have that. And uh, the one thing we have, is on global supplies. You know, we do have a record amount of global supplies. We know that. So, you know, what's, prices are so cheap. You have a huge short fund position. And I think some of that started to come out of the market a little bit. And you're having heavy deliveries, which is expected. But at the end of the day, 
these funds might do some short covering into the end of the year just to capture their bonuses and their money. Right. Um, and then we'll see what happens after the turn of the year. But also we have to keep an eye on South American weather, Argentina, uh, is going to have some weather issues here, I think. And so we just, you know, there's a lot of little things percolating, uh, but uh, we know that the wheat needs to have help. And okay. um, we'll Maybe see what happens. Maybe the bad news is in, we well, think, and, on the wheat market. And another thing that hurt us, I think, was the, of course, the extended period of exports out of Russia, out of the Black Sea. Their weather was milder than normal, so it kept those waterways open longer. And then with huge crops this year, you know, last year they were kind of hurt. This yeah. year they came back roaring. So they had plenty of supplies to, to export. And that's kind of been competitive. But now we're turning a little more competitive. Okay. Now, we've got a lot of questions for you, Sue Martin, from our Good. followers on social media. We encourage all of you to find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Just search for Market to Market. Unfortunately, we only have time for one. So I'm going to turn to the Ag Fix in Dakota Dunes, South Dakota. And he wants to know, or he notes, it kind of feels like the herd is getting really bearish on the grains. And you mentioned we did have record short in the wheat market. Do you agree with that, this herd mentality? mentality of, of bearish shortness, especially as we talk about corn. Very much I agree with him. Um, I think that, um, you know, there's that saying, when everybody's running, you should walk, and when everybody's walking, you should run. And um, I believe that we've been, well, first off, this is such an old bear market. You know, from the high of 2012, now we're heading into year seven. And, and, you know, I take cluster years, and I take when you have growing stocks mm -hmm. in corn and commingle that with growing wheat stocks in the U.S. and globally. And then a growing foreign production deficit, meaning the rest of the world doesn't produce enough. How needy are they? You know, it lets us kind of have an idea of how much we're going to be in the export market. And there's a record need for corn. So, and you look at corn and stocks have declined this year. Um, I think we're down, production's down, I wanna say around 10%. I think we're down 22 million metric tons, something like that. Okay. So, you know, you are heading in the right direction, but then you got this little nemesis of wheat out there. And I have to say, there is a large amount of feed wheat in the world. So that could kind of haunt us a little bit, but I have to tell you, a year of an eight usually tends to be a little better. Okay. And usually after a cluster year of a five or a six, you start seeing prices move higher. Last year, we put our low in. And I hate to say this because I think Twitter will come alive, <laughs> but uh, the 84-year cycle low was hit on corn last year on August 31st with the September contract at 301. Mm -hmm. This year, we've played inside the range of last year. We haven't made a higher high, and we haven't taken out the low. And ironically, this year, the September contract, again on August 31st, put our low in thus far for a lead contract. I had thought possibly the Ds would come down and make a lower low here than that September low. Just tag it by ever so little. Yeah. There's a wave five count on Ds corn, and that would then have turned us. Wave fives are extremely rare, though. Uh, we do have a wave three at 334, and we got to on a major scale, and we got down to 335 and three quarters yeah. this week. So, and then we turned. Like wheat, we have a huge wheat or a short position in corn, and that's creating some, uh, I think, short covering. Okay. You know, um, I think it was on Wednesday we had 51,000 contracts of open interest drop. Yeah. That was huge. Um, I think that we're going to see some short covering here. There's seasonals as well, where you buy corn on December 2nd and turn around and hold it till December 14th. And what's interesting is that's there's a seasonal on cattle sort of similar, but going down yeah. and corn going up. But have you noticed, we're into some old fashioned seasonal tendencies here where corn on days when it seems to start to percolate and bounce, cattle seem to get sold. Yep. Yep, it makes a lot of sense. So you think as we get into the end of the year, we could see some of those shorts get out of the, the market and uh, might see a little little bit of a rally? I think so. And okay. I also think that we have to look at South America, Argentina. Well, they used to be number two. And if they aren't, they aren't far behind yeah. that. And um, I think that when we look at Argentina, it's been a while since they've had a drought. And I think they're facing a pretty tough December here. And as we head down towards the latter half of December and wind towards the turn of the year, they're going to start getting closer towards that pollination period. 
And then you've got uh, southern Brazil, very southern Brazil, also in the same boat. And it sounds like their weather's really going to start to heat up and they're going to become very dry. And as we talk about soybeans, I mean, that's the story. We do have this potential of a drought pocket developing in Brazil. Yes. Sue, can we get a front month contract in soybeans back above $10 here before January 1? I think you'll be close, but if you've noticed, every time we get January's up there, the market catches selling. But if you look at a chart, we're forming a pennant formation, and we're getting really tight in that pennant. And so to me, and even wheat or corn's kind of forming a little bit of a, a wedge okay. uh, with a little bit of a downward slope. So, but um, when I look at the beans, I th here's what you've got to see this year. Again, inside range for beans. And so we didn't take out last year's low and we haven't taken out last year's high. I think there's promise. The crush is very good in China, um, almost record high. Mm -hmm. And their demand is huge. Uh, in the meantime, and also I should have talked more about that on corn. Maybe we can in We certainly will uh, in the Market Plus. Plus. You bet. But um, uh, basically, when I look at the soybean market, we need to see the Jan contract close over 997 on the last day of December. Okay. And we need to see March corn close over 351 on the last day of December. Doing that, you'll have an inside range year closing higher. All right. Well, now let's jump into the livestock market. We saw cattle take it on the chin a little bit this week. Live cattle jumped back. How seasonal is that for the first you know, week after Thanksgiving to see a pullback? Well, it is pretty seasonal. In fact, there's this uh, seasonal, I think, 15 out of the last 15 years they talk about. Now, granted, that's no guarantee. we got to get that little disclaimer mm -hmm. in there. But um, 15 out of the last 15 years, uh, the market has tended you sell on the 27th of November which this year was a nice rally day. And then you turn around and you buy it back around either the 9th or the 11th of December. Well, we've had some moves in here. Uh, we've had a 50% retracement in the feeders in the January. And that also, and even in the uh, fats, February fats yeah. as well. But we were also banging against 18, 20 day moving averages along with that 50% uh, 50, 50 retracement. And then the um, uh, product started softening. And for what we were hearing, packers were letting, there was talk that packers were just unloading meat today, even though they went out and paid three bucks higher this week for yeah. cattle okay. um, on Thursday, late, late Thursday into today. Now that seems kind of strange to me. It would be easy to be really bearish, mm -hmm. really easy. However, I struggle getting too negative. Now I think we'll come in here on Monday and we'll probably make a lower low than we did because why? You had an outside range November, higher high, lower low than October. And we'll probably come in and try to take the low of November out, which okay. should be not too tough. 115 and James yeah. on the live. Yeah, and on the uh, Jan feeders, 148 something. Okay. So, and then you there's technicians that'll say, oh, but you got a head and shoulders top here. That's gonna push you down to 146, 144 on the feeders. Maybe, however, I have indicators that I absolutely love on cattle, and they're very consistent on cattle. And those, you know, the inner days, the 180s were just wound for sound. They were flatlined at 99%. I have three indicators I watch. They all have to be together, and they were just overdone. So I knew we had to be careful, but I wouldn't have guessed that we would have as hard of a whoosh as okay. we got. But you have funds heavy long. Are they going to liquidate before the end of the year? They might. Okay. Uh, but on the same token, if you look at uh, meat sales, meat sales are huge. They're record large already into next year. So that means they're going to be buying cattle. But when I looked at my indicators, the 180 went into good correction today. Okay. It's not done yet, but I do have cycle timing on Monday, and we're breaking hard into it. That should put a low in. Okay. Well, now let's talk hogs. We've got the hog market up a little bit on the week against the cattle market. As we get to the end of this world, or the end of this year, <laughs> excuse me, Sue, how, how much that. more strength do you think we can find in this hog market? Well, um, you know, the hog market is, it looks like we've been, we backed up hogs a little bit through the holiday and what, what have you, and weights are up. We all know that. And we know that we have a lot of product, yes. you know, not only in beef, but in pork and poultry. But I look at the hog market and I'm wondering if we aren't going to see a chance for this hog, you know, cash is up around 58. Yeah. Now here's the deal, futures where they are around 65 or whatever, 
and cash at 58.85 or whatever, those two have to come together by the time you get into the 14th of December. So is the cash going up or is the futures coming down? Well, if you were to annihilate the cattle market, I suppose you would bring them down. But I'm kind of thinking down. you're going to see the cash try to hold here and push a little better. All right. Well, Sue Martin, thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Thank you. That wraps up the broadcast portion of Market to Market. However, we will keep the conversation going, including answering more of your questions during Market Plus, which is available in podcast and video form on our website. And speaking of podcasts, we now have three different offerings for you to download and rate. Check out M2M, a peek behind the scenes of this program from the analysts and producers, as well as extended conversations with newsmakers in the world of agriculture. Join us again next week as we examine pricing information gaps plaguing some livestock producers. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Wherever your operation takes you, or who you share it with, we'll be where we've been all along. With you, from the word go. Proud sponsor of Market to Market. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it.